once you get something out there, you should not think about it as a representation of yourself anymore. Treat it as a separate entity. And when that gets criticism, don't take it personally. It's a lesson to be learned. Like get like a historical fact wrong every, I don't know, three months uh, because I was too tired that day and just, I just posted whatever. Thinking of this as a collaborative process and it's not just you and your work, everybody like me. That's not what it's about. Several years down the line, you, you start to realize that. Hello, Clipper Hammers Tribe. This is Gab V, and we're back for season six, episode four, with our first guest from Asia. Today, we have Kyoto Cole from Tokyo, Japan. So, before you leave, you're like, I already know about Japan. No, you don't. So, stay. <laughs> But just to set the tone for this, when I asked Kyoto, okay, what do you want to talk about? This is what he said, and it really stood out to me. He said, Sharing your own culture in a way others can relate to and enjoy leads to chemistry and then even business. So let's find out how that works. I was very excited because I've been watching you on LinkedIn for about a year. You post Japanese folk tales, but you tell it in such a way that it's like, and then you know what happened, and then this happened, and most of your posts. Get between 70 to 100 engagements. There's a lot that we can learn from your style. In LinkedIn, I was surprised. It's a business oriented platform. I didn't expect people to、uh, like it so much.、Um, I have a、um, much bigger following on Instagram where I thought that was the place to do it. I was not expecting that. Yeah, it's a nice breath of fresh air after seeing. The millionth carousel of how to make your post more interesting. Like, this is an interesting story. Thank you for making my day. <laughs> But to start off here, Kyoto, we, as we were talking about before we started recording, many people have an idea in their head of what Japan is like. They think Tokyo, neon signs, Nintendo, and then the past is just shogunates and samurai and geishas. What are some other misconceptions about Japan that you can clear up just to get us in the, the right mindset for this conversation?、Uh, one thing I found out through this endeavor of、um, sharing、uh, history and culture of Japan through like, social media posts, doing all the research every day, a little over No, a little under half of Japanese people are living like really, really happy lives in Japan, and a little bit over a half of you know, the other half of the population,、uh, they're, they're living hellish lives. <laughs> Japan、uh, is a very, very livable place depending on、uh, how you understand the culture. I'm not even talking about non Japanese people who live in Japan, I'm talking about Japanese people who live in Japan. And、uh, there are people who、uh, are, I wouldn't say misunderstanding, but they're facing the wrong way in trying to pers-、uh, uh, interpret what Japanese culture is, Japanese life is, and they're suffering from it.、Uh, they just don't know how to look at it. <laughs> so、um, I don't know if that's a misconception, but、uh, not everyone's happy, but they could once they you know, start getting to lo- know the culture. I think it takes a storyteller to get them in, interested in the culture, even for Japanese people. What I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems that Japanese culture, especially since the Edo period of peace, has become very regimented in many of their societal standards. Could you give an example of, of how people might be facing the wrong way? That's a nice expression. I like that. I'm, I'm very surprised that you know that much.、Um, The Edo period was a period between 16, around 15 to 1868, so the late 19th century, when actually、uh, some historians would suspect that maybe Japanese people were happiest. It was much more liberal,、um, life was much more flexible, people were more lenient. So it became a lot more militaristic、uh, after、um, 1868. For the better or worse,、um, how did that happen? There was、uh, a stage of Japan where they thought, okay,、uh, we need to catch up. We need to play catch up with the Western world because they're far ahead and they, they seem a lot cooler than us. And they started you know,、um, absorbing Western culture 
as in Western culture, it meant a lot about technology and political construct and uh, well, societal construct. And uh, so there was an answer, right? There's this blueprint out there in the Western world. And um, the faster we got close to the blueprint, uh, the better off we were. And that was actually a fact uh, for a long time until, um, let's see, 1980s, 1990s. So people were, you know, um, given this mission to work really, really hard to get to that level. And we got there, I, I believe. And people were happy, you know, the, the harder they worked, the harder they followed instructions, very, very, very clear instructions, um, the better off they were. But now, um, now that we've caught up um, to a certain extent, uh, it's not just about following instructions. There are no more instructions. We need to think for ourselves. And uh, we were not trained to do that. <laughs> so uh, people are wondering who can give us that, that, that guiding light. It's never going to come. In a corporate world, especially, you're uh, expected to follow instructions, uh, follow your seniors. That kind of culture is still there, starting to fade, but still there. The entire body of Japan, Japanese people, is, has not stepped into that new era yet. We're starting to, but not yet. And pe many people are suffering because there's a mismatch of how we should be and how we are. The other thing I wanted to address is many of the countries in East Asia are very homogenous in terms of their ethnicity. So how does Japan feel about immigrants, their indigenous population? What is the relationship there? Perhaps like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I remember on the news, there was a lot of media coverage on um, people reacting negatively um, towards uh, more foreigners coming to work in Japan or even just tourists coming to Japan. But now I, I see none of that. Uh, I think many businesses are very dependent on um, tourists now, especially like touristy areas like, like Kyoto, for example, and of course, Tokyo. Japanese companies, they, they have already, I think, uh, recognized the, the fact that uh, they can't really operate with just Japanese people. They need more IT experts. And where are the IT experts? Well, there are a few in Japan, sure, but uh, we've already gone way into the competition of trying to steal that kind of person from uh, other companies. Uh, Japanese companies are starting to look abroad. Uh, where are the IT engineers? Oh, they're in the Philippines. They're in India. We're actually surrounded by many talented uh, engineers around Asia. And in order to get things rolling, we need the help of not just Japanese people. So I think uh, we're all already opened up to the idea of working with uh, non-Japanese people. Um, I think that's a great thing. I feel that it's growing, finally growing into an international uh, city, at least here in Tokyo. That's how I feel. And when I go to Kyoto, uh, I think from long ago, they were very, very um, accepting of uh, tourism. I feel a more positive, much more positive vibe towards uh, mingling with other cultures right now. Your English is perfect because you went to an international high school and college in the States and everything. But what is the, the general state of English in Japan as a nation? I actually uh, work for an online English school. I make uh, learning content there as a manager there. So actually, this is my field. Traditionally, Japanese people have not been adept at speaking the language uh, compared to any other Asian country. Japan is like third or fourth place uh, in terms of GDP worldwide. Uh, English proficiency tests for uh, international students uh, looking to study in uh, mostly the US, I guess. TOEFL score is among the lowest in Asia. <laughs> they have been the lowest for, I don't know, the last one or two decades. The traditional Japanese education system in terms of English was designed for excellence in test taking. So the goal of 
learning English in school was to get a good score in the college entrance exams. That means making an error in the articles or prepositions.、Um, that meant a minus point and、uh, less likelihood in joining、uh, the College of Your Dreams. So people are paranoid about making mistakes. That was the focus of Japanese English language education for a long time. And、uh, I see that background hindering. Uh, many Japanese adults from、uh, being expressive in this foreign language, English. They speak like this Nice, nice to meet, nice to meet, see, nice to meet, see, meet, meet you. My name is Kyota. I work, I, I work as for, they, they speak like this, literally. So, right. So, Um, yeah, they, they've been traumatized by this test taking culture,、uh, which is changing already. I can assume that there are、uh, many people in the education ministry who know better <laughs> and、uh, know what's wrong with the education system. So、uh, people are changing.、Um, the education system is changing. Many more young people, young Japanese people, they're less hesitant to communicate in English.、Um, and they see more international students in college. That, Barrier, that mental barrier, mental block,、um, is almost gotten rid of. So, I think that's great.、Uh, we will finally start internationalizing with more foreigners、uh, coming into Japan, thankfully. Yeah, it sounds like a, a good sign effect of globalization. Yeah. Very nice. Finally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm also an English teacher here in Germany,、mm. and I noticed that with my German students as well, where They've been focused so much on getting it perfect that、mm. nothing will come out. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're listening to this, you guys, as you can see from Kyota and even myself、oh. as a native English speaker, sometimes you're saying something and it doesn't come out quite the way that you wanted it to the first time. Just keep talking. That's life.、Right. When you went to the States for college, what were some of the cultural differences that you encountered? It must have been a bit of a A shock、mm-hmm. even after going to an international high school? Actually,、um, I wasn't shocked about the US per se, the, the American culture.、Uh, I was shocked that I didn't know anything about my own culture. My first year in college was、uh, 20, 2001. So、uh, 9 11 occurred. All the dorm mates were watching live and then. One dorm mate, I don't even remember his name,、uh, he asked me a bunch of questions about how I feel as a Japanese person. And that's when I realized, oh, I'm a Japanese person. And the other thing is, I don't have any opinion. You know, I just saw it and then I'm shocked, period. And、uh, I don't have any cultural context to share. And not embarrassing, but、uh, I felt it was a bit of a shame, you know. That I had nothing to share. You know, my SAT score was probably like a, a hundred points lower on a, than the average student there. Uh, uh, I think I was allowed in because I was an international student, right? I think the college was kind of expecting international students to you know, throw in some diversity there, and that I was not providing, I was not doing my job. So I thought a little ashamed of myself back then. <laughs> That's the cultural shock I、uh, witnessed on myself. So, then what did you do to get from that point of, I don't really know anything about my culture, to being the everyday storyteller that you are now? There's actually no link between that 9 11 story and <laughs> what I'm doing right now. <laughs> It's a very long break of me doing nothing about it. <laughs> So,、uh, it didn't really hit me、um, hard enough <laughs> to change my ways. <laughs> okay, well, that's an honest answer. So, then what was the turning point? What switched everything around?、Uh, so, as I told you earlier, I、um, created English learning content for an online English school. But、uh, at one point, I was told by the president that、uh, they were going to create an 
online business Japanese school and they need a curriculum, why don't you do it? And I said, okay, uh, I can try. Um, I thought, okay, then I need to understand the culture. And do I understand the culture? Uh, I don't at all. So I started studying. I started studying from the, the history of Japan, how it started, why it was called Japan in the first place, and、uh, what people ate, hoping eventually I'll be able to explain why Japanese business people act or behave in certain ways during certain situations. And I found myself hooked in the history and the culture and the, the, orig the original intention, the mission of. You know,、uh, teaching myself Japanese culture to create this、uh, online Japanese business school went out the window, was not important anymore. I was hooked. And,、uh, you know, how you learn best when you output、uh, what you learned. So I knew that. So I kept posting,、uh, not SNS at that time,、um, it was on a, a blog that I made for myself. But anyway, what I'm doing right now is very similar to. What I was doing five years ago. That was when I yeah, started becoming a storyteller, not so much a storyteller. I'm trying to explain、uh, with, with very long、uh, blog posts that you know, are like 30,000 words per piece. You know? And you know, some people liked it, but、uh, it, was, it wasn't really res、uh, resonating with people because I think of the sheer length, that was not the right approach.、Um, I figure out what the right approach is much later, about I think three years in. I can. That's when I started the SNS approach. Yes. It's a fusion of the Asian way of explaining and the Western way of explaining. In the Western cultures, we say five reasons you should do blah, blah, blah. And then we go into the thing. But in Asian cultures, they give you all of the backstory and everything. And it's like, so that's the reasons you should do this thing. <laughs> right, right, right. The conclusion comes at the very, very end. <laughs> And then you find out what you were listening into at the very, very end. So,、yeah, right. and I love your style because you've combined the two with the stories in your book, which I love the story about the, the old woman that was hiding. We'll talk more about that book in a second. But you tell the story, which is always like, oh man, I didn't think that was going to end that way. And then you give the cultural context afterwards so you can set aside both sides. <laughs> Well, thank you for reading that book. <laughs>、um, yeah, it's been amazing. It's, it's nice to hear some other folk tales because I think we've all heard Little Red Riding Hood and the Three Little Pigs too many times. It's just like, what else is there? It's not that I'm an expert in folk tales, it's just folk tales was、um, a topic that I felt I could see, it, see through. I,、uh, like book writing, I don't know if you've tried, but It's an excruciating process. You know, it takes a long time, and patients need to devote a lot of your time and、uh, brain cells on it.、Uh, but I thought, you know, if it's folktales, I think I can do it because half the story is told. I need to、um, talk about the cultural context, but、uh, I don't have to think of the hook. You know, as the title says, it's like 28 folktales. I just bring in 28 folktales, I translate in, a, in an engaging way, and the, half my story is done. Then I can concentrate on, like, focus、uh, all my other brain cells on、uh, explaining the culture that's relevant、um, to the featured folktale. Doing all the research myself, I realized there's a huge difference in、uh, approach of Japanese traditional folktales, who most of them we don't know who made it, compared to like Grimm's folktales. They have very different narratives, types of narrative patterns. So that was an interesting finding for me. Yeah. And how long did it take you to compile the book? I think it was like not nine months. I think it could, ha could have been shorter、um, if I stuck to my, the schedule I <laughs> <laughs> drew for myself. Still pretty fast. That's still pretty fast. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So I'm trying to speed up so that I could get my second book out、um, in less than nine months, maybe in a half a year. I think if I, I'll be happy if I could get. Churn out one book、uh, every, every half a year. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Then we have Brothers Grimm for the Western fairy tales and Kyotako for the Eastern fairy tales. With the feedback, what has been the feedback for the first volume? How many books have you sold? What have people been saying? It was my first time to write 
uh, a book in English. Actually, I have published like two books in Japanese on like how to uh, present your scientific findings in English uh, way back. Uh, but I didn't do it myself. I just uh, had a publisher who helped me through the process. But this time I was going to uh, self-publish uh, publish on Amazon. And I, I need to do everything myself. So I joined this, this webinar or two um, supporting uh, like would-be authors uh, and uh, telling them what to do. First of all, uh, I needed to um, prepare for the launch. So I create this email list uh, from my Instagram followers. This was way before uh, I started on LinkedIn. And then the initial month, I made like sales to all 100 people, which was not bad. After that, I mean, there's no like organic um, purchases yet. Um, Amazon uh, recommends my book uh, pretty highly, but, you know, not many people would look, go online and search the keyword Japanese folktales. You know, not, not every day, right? So um, actually, I make sales from my posts, my almost daily posts. And every day I have like two people buy, thankfully, from the post. Uh, it's, it's amazing. As an author, I can't make a living from that alone yet because one reason is I only have one book. Probably if I had two, three, four books, then it would multiply, multiply that way. But uh, I'm very thankful that, you know, people um, feel that, hey, I might give this guy a try through reading those short anecdotes, short stories that I post almost daily. Uh, I, I've been very happy about that. I, I'm going to continue doing this um, until until I you know um, start to see that it's not working anymore. I think I sold like 400 books so far. That means I sell about like 60 ish books a, a month. So it's it's slow, but there is progress daily. So I'm very very thankful for that. Yeah, that's amazing. So let's peel it back a little bit hmm. because your posts are very well written and I know that doesn't just happen. So how far in advance do you have to plan a post because you have it, the well-written text and then also a picture to go with the text, which is usually like a, um, a silk print or some other hmm. picture of a, a Japanese historical site. How do you plan those? So most of the pictures, I mean, the photos I take, are taken by me myself in and around Tokyo, where I can you know come back in within a day. Tokyo was uh, reduced to ashes in 1945, so uh, most parts are clusters of distasteful um, concrete buildings, <laughs> and uh, there's not much to share. I don't think um, in, in the context of Japanese culture. So, but but there are some select uh, places that were lucky enough to um, uh, avoid the, the bombing or some culturally woke people or local governors were keen enough to uh, rebuild uh, like beautiful Japanese gardens and everything. Um, so I go there um, not every weekend, but whenever I can. And I, I pick up photos there. As long as it's beautiful, there's some use um, later, sometime in the future. So I sometimes pick up uh, photos I took like a year or two ago uh, and uh, pair it with a story that I happened to come across uh, through my daily reading on Japanese culture. I, I'm not doing it on schedule. I just, uh, I just have convinced myself that reading um, on Japanese culture and history every day and going around these places whenever I can, uh, they, they work. So I do it. I just do it. And um, I usually have a story to share uh, almost every day. And when I don't, I don't. And I have to go to bed or I don't have the energy to create a post after like a long day of work. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way to keep it fresh. I like that. I also noticed that you had a podcast that has been discontinued this year. So could you give <laughs> us some of, some of the backstory yeah. of, of what was that about and why did it stop? Right. <laughs> when I was writing my blog, I told you like it took like it came out to like thirty thousand words a post, and podcasts. I think you know because you, you're doing it as we speak. Uh, it takes a lot of 
energy, a lot of time to uh, produce one episode, actually, especially if you're doing it alone. Uh, I was too much of an introvert to uh, um, do interviews, uh, interview type uh, podcasts like you're doing, which is great. Uh, but I was not that kind of person, so I need to create uh, like a script for myself that took like hours, and then recording that took like an hour or two, and it was not uh, sustainable. Basically, it was not sustainable. Th that's the reason I gave up on that. I needed to find another medium, another way to post things, uh, share my findings. Otherwise, it was not going to last. So. I started with blog posts and then I went to podcasts. Uh, I had a lot of traction there, but unfortunately, it was not sustainable uh, for my lifestyle, having a day job, having a kid, for example. Um, so I shifted slowly to focusing on SNS. It's great because then you found something that, that fits your style. I know if you're watching this podcast, guys, you can tell, even though it's an interview, I'm only talking maybe 15% of the time, but to get mm. this to the edited format where it's reaching you, it might be 15 or 20 hours behind the scene. <laughs> so I know what you're talking about, Kyoto. <laughs> you found a way to still engage with your public. I love those posts. Whenever I find one, it's like the last French fry in the bag. You're like, yes, Kyoto, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's very flattering. Thank you. But as... Someone who has lived in another country for school, now you're helping your own countrymen to learn English. What would you give as advice to someone who is maybe feeling stuck and they want to have like a, a side hustle in English, but it's not their first language? Um, I think if you're in that state, you're trying to use the language, your language is probably not that uh, not that bad um, already, right? Um, you're trying to figure out what you can do with the language. That's great. You've probably reached a point in your learning journey where you're entering a new realm. You know, it's not about learning English or learning language anymore. It's about um, uh, thinking back. Why in the first place did I want to learn this language? What what am I going to use it for? and you're starting to explore, that's great. You just have to um, try it out, try something. The first one will probably not work for you for many reasons. So you have all these agenda in your mind. Uh, okay, I want to look cool. I want my, my, my posts to be intellectual sounding, intellectual looking. I want all the designs to be you know, uh, presentable. And you have all these ideas, ego basically, ego that manifest in fatigue, basically. As you continue, you find out, okay, maybe I didn't need this. I didn't need that. I didn't need this. And then you, you, you settle in a place where uh, you can comfortably continue and uh, you yourself have fun and your audience has fun uh, uh, looking at your content. You, know, you need to continue for a long time, like years, but you start to see this balance. Yeah, it's like trial and error, trial and error. Uh, your English competency is not the most important thing. It's your persistence that's most important. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And also, I really admire you, Kyoto, because you have the persistence, but also the humility to know when it's time to let something go. Not everyone can do yeah. that. <laughs> it hurts, right? You know, You're like, oh, it didn't work, but it's my baby. It's like, it's not your baby. Kill it. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get something out there, you should not think about it as a representation of yourself anymore. Treat it as a separate entity. And when that gets criticism, don't take it personally. It's a lesson to be learned. I get like a historical fact wrong every, I don't know, three months uh, because I was too tired that day and just, just posted whatever. Thinking of this as a collaborative process and it's not just you in your work, everybody like me. That's not what it's about. Several years down the line, you, you start to realize that. I think my main platforms are Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, on Instagram, it's far easier to scroll to find stories in case you're like um, hopelessly bored. <laughs> 
my personal opinion, it looks pretty pretty um, as you scroll through all the um, footages of uh, traditional Japanese scenery, which are the photos I take, and woodblock prints and paintings of ancient Japanese artists. It's like a mix of that. It's like a tapestry of um, those things on Instagram. Please don't expect me to update my blog or my podcast anymore because normal time on normal daily SNS posts and uh, book writing of uh, the next uh, book. It's most likely going to be titled Underdogs of Japanese History. Yeah. Do you have an estimated uh, drop date for that? What is it coming? That's a good question that will actually uh, pressure me to work harder. I hope I can get it out again uh, in summer, no later than autumn 2023. So I think I'll aim for that. Yes. Very yeah. nice. So this episode will be coming out in, in April 2023. So it'll be the, oh. the first step of your book tour promo. Oh. <laughs> right. Yes. It's the first mentioning of the second book. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, that'll be really cool. I'm looking forward to that. But I want to say thank you so much, Kyoto, just to yeah. let you guys know. It's almost 10 p.m. in Tokyo that he's talking to me. So this guy is the real deal. Very flexible. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for the, the thoughtful questions. It made me think for myself and come up with answers that I had, didn't have. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for answering. It gave me a new perspective on Japan, just like you always do. Thank you, everybody, for listening to, with us until the end. And we'll see you next time.